uh, yeah, my family was very close knit. The, the four of us, my mum and dad, and my wee sister and me, very tight family unit. Uh, but we were also very close to grandparents and aunts and uncles. So it was a, a very traditional upbringing in many uh, respects, but a very happy one as well. My overwhelming memories of childhood are of lots of love and lots of happiness. And what kind of older sister were you? Because, you know, Gillian does tell a few little tales. Uh, unfortunately, she has over the years told a few little tales that I'd probably prefer it if she hadn't. Um, <laughs> Younger I think sisters I was, do that, they though, do, don't they? Yeah, she still does, unfortunately. Um, I was probably quite a bossy older sister. Um, right. And Jill and I are, in some ways, and probably the older we get, actually more similar than different. But when we were children, we were very different kinds mm. of children. She was much more the... Well, she was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. I was dark and dark-eyed. She was into frilly dresses and dolls, and I wasn't. Mm. Um, so as well as being bossy, I think I, I probably tried to bully her a wee bit into doing the things I wanted to do rather than the things that she wanted to do. Uh, but I would say roles have reversed the older we've got, and she yeah. probably bosses me around more now. Good for her. Um, as a younger sibling, I identify with that. <laughs> so um, she says you used to cut the hair off her Barbie dolls. <laughs> I did it once. <laughs> that sounds as if I was a serial, um, you know, sort of defacer of, of Barbie dolls. We have, we, we, I don't think we've been able to agree between ourselves. The story is true. I, I have to admit it now that she had a, a Barbie or a Cindy. I think we disagreed between ourselves whether it was Barbie or Cindy. But oh, anyway, there's a big I, difference. There was a big difference. <laughs> Um, and I can't remember which way round we we think it was, but I cut the hair off it. Basically, it was you know, I thought she was being silly playing with this doll, and the hair was annoying me or something. So I took a pair of scissors to it, but it was a one off. So you didn't do dolls. You had no truck I, with dolls. I, I did dolls sometimes, but I wasn't I wasn't the kind of we get all that liked playing with dolls a lot. Um, I used to get very annoyed when you know I couldn't get their clothes to sit properly and things like that. So I wasn't mm. very patient, but I was much more into. Um, books and reading. I was quite a studious child and, and playing with dolls didn't really interest me that much. And I, I, I mean, although you were bossy, uh, I, I'm told you were also quite shy and you spent um, a lot of your fifth birthday hiding under the table. Do you remember that shy five-year-old? Well, I, yeah, the shy five-year-old, believe it or not, given that she's sitting here talking to as First mm. Minister of Scotland, is, is today a, still a quite shy, almost 50-year-old. Mm. Um, so I was bossy with my sister. I was probably bossy with my parents, but to the rest of the world, I was pretty shy. And actually, as I say, still am quite shy. So my mum tells a story, and I do I have a memory of, of this story at my fifth birthday party when all the other kids were playing party games. I, I sat under the table um, reading a book, which is what I would still choose to do today, given, <laughs> given the opportunity. Um, so yeah, I, I was quiet and shy and a bit introverted, um, but also quite a determined wee girl, um, which probably also holds true today. But it's extraordinary, really, how you emerged from under the table, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> to the role that you're currently in. I mean, how did you overcome that so shyness? I'm, I'm not sure I'm that much different today, because I've always had this strange... Well, I don't know. I'll leave other people to decide whether it's strange. It's maybe mm. not that unusual. This combination of being quite shy, quiet, introverted but also a sort of inner resolve and determination I always knew what I wanted and I knew what I wanted to do and to achieve so I've always managed to combine that but even in my job today the some of the most difficult aspects of it for me are, are overcoming that natural reserve and shyness and going into a room full of people and, and talking to people I, I don't know I, I handle that much better when I'm making a speech to people maybe there's something of a, a performance element to that than I do just you know sort of conversing normally so that is something that over the years I've had to to struggle to overcome mm. a bit and and you know maybe maybe you overcompensate for that a little bit so the the determination has to be greater in order to overcome the the natural reserve I don't know um so you kind of pushed I'm yourself a psychologist you pushed yourself so far maybe out of I'm, your comfort zone that you ended up yeah. being first minister <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe somebody should have warned me about that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess there is a bit of that. That, and I suppose it's like anybody. You 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 overcompensate for. Well, I was going to say weaknesses. Whether I don't know whether that's the right word, but you over you, you overcompensate for the bits of your personality that, if left to to rule the roost, would hold you back mm. a bit. And so I guess from a very young age, 
I, I did that. I mean, I, you know, I'm probably getting ahead of you in this interview, but I remember in my early days at university having to work really hard to overcome a sense of not really being sure if I was up to it and, and having to force myself to carry on. We'll talk about your imposter syndrome later on. But um, so... <laughs> so all, all my psychological sort of yeah. <laughs> hang-ups are going to come out over the oh, course yes. of this. So your, um, your younger sister, who Jill, who you've mm. already talked about, called you the sensible one with your head always in books. Mm. And you have said, you know, you were under the table reading the book then. Do you think books are still, they were a refuge for you then and a refuge for you now? Oh, absolutely. Um, I am really happier than I am when I'm, I've got my head stuck in a book. Um, mm. And I, I find, you know, it's just always something I've enjoyed doing. It's always been a favourite pastime, favourite uh, source of entertainment but I suppose the older I've got and actually probably in, in this job that I do it's become a lot more than that to me so it's also a sort of way of de-stressing and also just giving a bit of perspective on everything else and, yeah. and, and learning I suppose I, I do I, I read more fiction than non-fiction um, and so I, I've always been a great believer that fiction it gives you a, a much deeper understanding I think of humanity, you know, different cultures, different parts of the world, different periods in history. And and I think it's a, I've, I've said before, I think it's something probably all politicians should maybe do a bit mm. more just to, to broaden that sense of, of understanding and empathy. And you didn't, you know, you had a very happy childhood, you, you've said. Um, you, you were also a little bit bullied at primary school, weren't you? Do you remember what kind of things happened there? Um, I wouldn't overstate it. Um, there was a couple of periods, I think, later in primary school where there was very much, as I'm sure, unfortunately, there there often is, I was going to use the term gangs, I think that would be too too strong, so I don't mean it in the formal sense, but there was mm. groups in my class and I, I never liked that. I never really liked picking one over the other. And so I ended up sort of, you know, falling between the two or in, you know, being sort of bullied by one while been perceived to be on the other side and then vice versa so there was yeah. there was a couple of periods where uh, I think there was one uh, occasion certainly where it, it got actually physical at one point but it didn't last very long and I think it was just a feature of never really which is a bit a bit odd maybe since I joined a political party and, and given the tribalism of politics um, I suppose back then I, I really didn't like that I didn't like choosing one group of friends if it meant excluding another but in this, you said it got physical. There was a sort of fight where you came off the worst. Yeah, I, which in a physical sense, I probably still would if somebody tried to <laughs> quote me. I'm not, I'm not a great, you know, I, I just would. I think back then I, I didn't really fight back because it, it just didn't instinctively. It's not, not the thing I would have done. Um, which is not to say I was a, a sort of, I, I didn't stand up for myself. I would always stand up for myself. Um, even although I had to sometimes overcome that shyness we've been talking about, but I'm, I've always been better with, well, this will sound terribly wrong because I've never really used my fists in that way, mm. but I've always been better defending myself with my mouth than yeah. anything else. And you've acquired a reputation as quite a sort of fierce rhetorical fighter, which I'll come back to. Um, just before we move on to the sort of next stage of, of your life, um, it wasn't a, a political household, was it? Your dad was an electrician, your mum a dental nurse. And yet you forged this sort of hatred of Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s, which did politicise you, didn't it? Tell us why that was. It, it wasn't a political household um, in the sense, I mean, it wasn't. But I found out later on, um, long after I'd been involved in the SNP and actually long after he had died, that my, my grandfather, my, my, my dad's dad, had been a member of the SNP in the 1960s. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, it was literally we found a membership card, I think, um, I don't know, there must have been some clear out of the house or something. So, mm. And I think my uncle had also been a, a member previously as well. So there was obviously something there, um, even though I hadn't been aware of it uh, at the time. Um, the Thatcher thing, and I, I don't I, I don't like the word hatred because it's mm. an, an emotion I try not to, uh, to succumb to. Uh, but I, I grew up at the, I suppose, the height of the Thatcher government. I was at secondary school in, in the mid-80s. And damage the Thatcher government did was just evident all around me in the you know the, the devastation to, to industry unemployment was extremely high I have an overwhelming kind of memory of of the fear of your your dad losing his job 
thankfully mine never did. But this sense that I had when I was growing up that if that ever happened to your dad, he would probably never get another one because mm. unemployment was was so not just rife but but so endemic and and at that point it just appeared to be you know so long term if it happened to you and there was a sense at my school that you know lots of us would leave school and and there would be no opportunity so I just had this sense of Thatcher as as leading a government that just didn't seem to care about people like me and people I was growing up with and and I suppose and this perhaps is then one of the things that took me in the political direction I went in that seemed to be exacerbated in my teenage mind um, by the fact that the ma vast majority of people in Scotland never voted for Thatcher so mm. we were we weren't only uh, living with the impact of this we were living with an impact that we hadn't chosen the, the, the people in Scotland voted differently and overwhelmingly back then people in Scotland voted Labour so it just seemed to be injustice upon injustice which uh, is certainly I think what took me in the political direction that I then went in. You're listening to Times Radio with Cathy Newman and I'm speaking to Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon about her life, times and a sent up the political ladder. So let's talk about how you got your foot on the, on the first rung of the ladder. You joined the SNP aged 16 um, and I think Am I right in saying that you became sort of really politically active at Glasgow Uni? Is that right? Then my, my first uh, experience of political campaigning was in the the 1987 general election, and then it was the year after that that I went to to uni. But but it was at university that it really took off, and, and I guess became such a big feature of my life. And your first election campaigning work, I think if I've done my maths right, it was 33 years ago and you were, <laughs> you, was, <laughs> you were 17. I just wonder what the sort of the shy teenager, how you found leafleting in the 1987 election campaign. How did that go? Well, that, that was a really good example of having to overcome and mm. really consciously work hard at overcoming that shyness. And, and I became part of a local campaign team that were really supportive to me then and, and actually most of them those that are still around continue to be very supportive of me to this day the the candidate in my local constituency a, a wonderful woman uh, called Kay Ulrich um, that I went I, I remember vividly she tells the story better than I do actually um, with a few embellishments along the way no doubt knowing mm. Kay um, but you know I turned up at her front door I'd never I knew her daughter recently a bit so I knew her and knew of her but I'd never really spoken to her before and I turned up at her door and said I'd like to come out and campaign for you and you know again that was for, for people who didn't know me well that would have seemed such an out of character thing to do and then she was lovely and they kind of took me under their wing but the whole, whole thing about putting out leaflets was wasn't the the half of it knocking people's doors and asking them how they were going to vote and trying yeah. to persuade them that was you know it was something that that was a big thing and I had to really really force myself to do it but that's where also this inner determination comes in because I was determined that I wanted to do it so I, I did overcome the shyness and do you remember some awkward encounters on oh the lots <laughs> lots the yeah. SNP wasn't the political force then that it is now so most doors we were going to people would with varying degrees of politeness <laughs> um, tell you to sling your hook <laughs> so it wasn't an easy experience um, I actually I've got a vivid memory of uh, a guy who remains a very good friend of mine and we went to a door and unfortunately they came and they were uh, halfway through a funeral at the time so we oh. apologised and went away and it wasn't particularly pleasant but the, the layout of this house in the state was really confusing so the next door we kind of went around a corner and went to what we thought was another door but too late realised that it was the back door of the same house oh, no. that we'd just gone to so <laughs> that was really oh, probably worse dear. for the family than it was for us but it was <laughs> it was yeah. horrible. So you fought your first parliamentary election just 21, mm -hmm. you were the youngest, yeah. mm -hmm. and then elected a member of the Scottish Parliament 1999, Shadow Minister for Children and Education. Did you feel at that point you'd really arrived? Um, I'm not sure I'd ever have got to that point. <laughs> <laughs> not even now. now. See, I think... The point you reach, and I don't mean I'm first minister now, and, and of course, in, in political good. terms, you know, there's there's not much of the ladder yeah. left to climb. So I, I don't mean it in that sense that I'm still, you know, and... Well, there's always Prime Minister of the UK, you know. 
I think that's unlikely. <laughs> that may be your ex- political exclusive out of this interview, but I think it's unlikely. Um, there'd have to be a, a major sort of political change of heart <laughs> on my part to me. That's Stranger likely. things have happened. Not many, but <laughs> never say never. Um, maybe it's the kind of working class Scottish girl in me that thinking you've arrived to me denotes a kind of sense of complacency and, and hubris almost that yeah. I would just never, ever want to to have and mm. and so I don't think I ever got to a point and thought I've arrived I've always had this this feeling right throughout my my life my career that you know you have to work really hard to get to any position and then you have to work really hard to prove you're up to it and then work really hard to to not make a mess of it and then if you get to go further that's that's great so I, d- I don't think I've ever really felt that's it I can put my feet up and and relax I can't help but contrast Boris Johnson wanting to be world king. You never, <laughs> you never sat at home in your bedroom wanting to be world queen. Um, I, I don't remember ever thinking I wanted to be world queen, but I, I think as a young girl, I was ambitious. I, I think back then, I didn't know that I wanted to be a politician. I didn't know that I wanted to be. Well, there wasn't a first minister of Scotland at the time, so. But I suppose back then I had a sense, and it comes back to this inner determination. I wanted to do something, and I don't. Mm. I don't I'm not sure I. I knew what something was. I wanted to be a lawyer for as, from as far back as I can remember. I don't know why. I don't know where that came from. I went on and became a lawyer. I also had this thing that I was going to become a, a famous children's author, which I, I haven't managed to do. There's um, still time. There's well, still you never time. know. That's probably more likely than becoming Prime Minister of the UK, <laughs> I would say. And so so there was a there was an ambition there to, to make a mark, I guess. But I've always had this sense of nothing would fall into my lap. I, I mm. would always have to work at it and, and prove myself. And I, I guess I still, to some extent, you know, feel that today. And maybe it's mm. not a bad thing. Mm. Well, you did my, make a mark. You As you ascended the ladder over the next few years, you had a variety of portfolios. You pushed to ban tobacco advertising, freeze prescription drug charges, mm. provide free fresh fruit in primary schools. You won awards, but you were still worried about being taken seriously in politics. I think you used to phrase earlier on imposter syndrome, which is mm. a you know is the kind of you know buzz phrase for something that I think a lot of women in particular, not exclusively, but women in particular, feel, which is that. You know, you're always about to be found out that you're not quite up to what you're doing and, and therefore you have to really, really work hard to, to prove yourself. And and I've always had that. And maybe it's a bit of the working class girl. I definitely think a lot about being a woman in what throughout my career has been and to some extent less so, but still to some extent is a man's world yeah. about all of that. But, you know, I've, I've come to the, the conclusion in my head that it's not a bad thing. Mm. Actually having to work really hard and and believing you have to work really hard, particularly when you're in jobs that have a lot of responsibility and are, are serious jobs, then, you know, that's a good thing, at the actually, moment, particularly you know. at the moment. Yeah. Um, do you do you think there was a lot of you talked about being a, a woman in a man's mm. world? Was there a lot of sexism? Did you experience a lot of sexism in that world? When I when I look back, I was I can't point to a single episode or or time in my life where I would say, yep, I was prevented from doing X because I was a woman. So that that kind of overt, but. And at the time, I guess I wasn't as conscious of it. But looking back, of course, I was surrounded by sexism and misogyny all of the time. And and you might only, I probably only understand that fully looking back on it. But it ranges from, you know, the, the commentary that you know I still get and that every woman in politics and the media, to be frank, still get about how you look and, mm. and you know, what you wear and, and how you how you hold yourself. One of the things that was always said about me when I was younger is that I never smiled. Mm. You know, A, it wasn't true and B, you know, would anybody say that about a man? Mm. Um, you know, people do judge you differently when, you know, when you're held to higher standards. Again, there's an element of that that's not fair, although I think we should all try and take advantage of that by showing that we can, you know, meet higher <laughs> higher standards. So yeah, that kind of sexism was, was around all of the time. I, I and I've I had this sense of and I won't be unique here at all of the way to get on in politics was to fit in with yeah. people around me so subconsciously at the time but definitely definitely the case I would you know you'd perhaps dress 
a bit more conservatively to to look more like the sort of suited men around you be a bit more adversarial than you were comfortable being because that's how politics was done by the men around you and yeah it's only relatively recently not yesterday or last year but relatively recently that I've realized the most important thing for any woman in any walk of life but I'm talking about politics here is to be yourself and yeah. not feel that you have to emulate those around you it's how I earned what people associate with the term nippy sweetie it's not actually how I earned the nickname the nickname came uh, uh, by a, a wonderful man one of the the best people I've ever met in my life, Jamie Webster, who was the trade union convener at the Govan shipyard mm. during the campaigns to save the Govan shipyard from closure. And he he called me that, as a, he said this himself, as a compliment, somebody who stood up and, and fought her corner. Um, and it's a famous kind of Scottish phrase. But yes, it's, it's then been used to describe somebody who's very, you know, severe and... Uh, you know, takes yourself too seriously, aggressive, yeah. adversarial. And definitely, I think that was to a large extent from what I've just described there of of this sort of subconscious feeling that you, I had to emulate the, the middle-aged men that I was surrounded by. Mm. Now, as Alex Salmon's deputy in 2004, you, you built this reputation as a, a tough political operator. The nippy sweetie nickname came in. <laughs> Um, you've described Alex Salmond as your friend, mentor and colleague for more than 20 years. Now, of course, he was cleared of 13 sexual offences earlier this year and you've now got to give evidence under oath to a Scottish Parliament inquiry into the mis mishandling of misconduct claims against him. So I, I know there's a limit to what you can mm -hmm. say, but but given what an influential figure you've said in the past he has been in your life, how difficult has the rift between the two of you been for you? Um. Look, it, it's been personally difficult. Um, I mean, I would, I suppose, I would just reference or, or say to people, imagine how it would feel, uh, you know, for any reason and whatever the circumstances, if somebody that has been one of the biggest presences in your life, um, you know, outside my own family, my husband, probably the most. Uh, significant adult in my life for all of my adult life, and just imagine that, and then imagine that they're not there in that role anymore and it, it's difficult um so yeah it has, it has been and and I suppose to some extent always will be um personally difficult I'm not I've not been able to talk about this because of the the criminal trial and then when the criminal trial ended I was immersed as I still am in, in Covid I will get the opportunity to to talk about that in the parliamentary inquiries uh, that are to come and and while you know I wouldn't say I I relish that prospect at all. Um, there will, to some extent, be a sense of relief at just being able to to, to have my say and, and put my side of it across, and and then let people make up their own minds. But but until then, you know, there's not really much more I'm, I'm able to say about it. Do you think it's interesting you're talking about having your say? Do you think you have been smeared, traduced? Oh, look, there's been things said about me that I, I will certainly uh, want to to give a different <laughs> a different view of, but. Um, you know, I've not been able to do that, and for obvious reasons, I've not been able to do that. And and you know, people will make up their own minds about it about it all. But um, as I say, I don't I, I don't relish any of this at all, um, and I, I don't think anybody does. But but when you've not been able to speak about something for a lengthy period of time, then I, I guess there'll be a sense of release when I'm I'm able to do that. You talked about losing someone who's been such a big influence on your life. It sounded almost like you were sort of grieving for that loss. Um, okay, look, it's not it's not. That's not the circumstance, obviously, so I don't want to overstate this. But, but yeah, I, I guess what you're saying is not completely wrong either. There is a sense of uh, something that I suppose is, is not a million miles from from a, a sort of grieving process. But, you know, we all go through difficult things and, mm. and we have to cope with them. So when Alex Salmon stood down after losing the 2014 Indie referendum. You um, you ran for the leadership, becoming Scotland's first female leader. But do you remember what went through your mind at that point? A sort of pride, sense of history. Do you remember? I was exhausted mm. <laughs> at that point. Uh, possibly not as much as I, I feel now, given yeah. what we're dealing with just now. But we'd just come out of the independence referendum, which was just you know something that had happened at 100 miles an hour that I'd given everything to, and then you know became first minister not long after that so yeah there was a sense of uh, it being a bit of a whirlwind and, and you become first minister and so very immediately you've got a million things to 
to worry about and to occupy your time and your your energies and your thinking so there's not a lot of opportunity to take a step back and think about it in the bigger picture but but yes there was a consciousness of the the magnitude of it and the scale of it and and being the first woman to to be first minister in what is still a a short life of of the Scottish Parliament and the, and the Scottish government mm. But you led the party to, you know, a historic landslide in the 2015 general election. And I think I'm right in saying that under your leadership, the SNP has won six successive elections. Well, you, I'm glad you said that because it would be sort of given <laughs> into that hubris that I said earlier on that I never did if I had pointed it out. <laughs> but I mean, you must feel a sense of real pride about what you've achieved. And um... yet... <laughs> If I can put the and yet to you, the prize you've really spent a lifetime dreaming yeah, about yeah, still look, eludes you, Scottish so there, independence. There's two things I, I think that that keep me from sort of, I, I suppose, agreeing with what you've just said there. One is what I talked about earlier on that, you know, I was, there is a definite kind of Scottishness about this is the whole pride becomes before a fall sort of thing. So, but I think it's a more general point about politics. I think any politician that ever gets to the point that says, ah, that's it, I've, I've done it, I've achieved everything that I want to achieve, there's nothing more for me to do here, that's the point you should get out because politics is, and I don't want to sound too you know, high-minded about this, but possibly more than anything else, politics should be about the pursuit of, of making the world a better place. And at any point, if you think you've done all that there is to do there, then get out and make way for somebody else. But do you think that ultimate prize for you, the Scot of Scottish independence, do you fear that it, it might never happen? It, no, I think it will happen. <laughs> not this I, year, though. I'm pretty well. Not this year, but in Scottish independence, will happen. Um, but it, I mean, it will only happen if and when a majority of people in Scotland want it to happen. It won't happen because I say it should happen, or any other politician says it should happen. But I believe that is the path Scotland is on and I think when that day comes and I think it will be sooner rather than later then you know we, we don't turn our backs on others across the UK we become a, a an equal partner and we take more responsibility for our own uh, decisions and forging our own path in the world and I think it will be a thoroughly good thing and if independent what independence wasn't a thoroughly good thing we wouldn't have as many independent countries in the world including many that have become independent in in relatively recent times. You're listening to Times Radio with Cathy Newman. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has been talking to me about how she transformed herself from a shy girl who loved to bury her nose in a book, became politically engaged through her opposition to Margaret Thatcher, before becoming the first woman to lead Scotland. Now we're going to turn to Nicola Sturgeon's advice on how to climb the ladder. So, Nicola Sturgeon, you're about to turn 50. I don't like to remind you of that. but Thanks um, so much. <laughs> What have you learned? What can you share? <laughs> um, I have learned so much. I still learn so much every single day and I'd, I'd hate to get to the point where I felt as if I'd, I'd stopped learning and, mm. and didn't have anything else to learn. I suppose if I was to try to distill it, I mean, it's, I suppose my advice is be ambitious. To, to women in particular, don't, don't think ambition is a dirty word. It's not. There's nothing wrong with being ambitious. But just focus on doing what it is you're doing, what you're trying to achieve and doing it to the very best of your ability and you'll find if you do that the you'll you know take take the rungs in your stride but if you set out with i want to get to rung three or four and focus on that rather than on what you're doing that's when you might find you don't quite make it concentrate and, on the one goal in front of you because if you muck mm. up what you're doing right now then the the rungs higher up will, will never you'll find your feet never get on to mm -hmm. them. And my other piece of advice, which is, is something that, you know, I didn't practice, and we touched on this earlier on, is be yourself. And, and particularly to women, particularly to younger women, that is the most important piece of advice. Be yourself and don't try to fit in or emulate people around you, particularly particularly men around you. Just be yourself and, and, and find your own path and, and don't be scared to make mistakes because we all make mistakes and it's it's often the mistakes and the tough times in your life that you learn most from. And we've touched on this already, but um, I just wanted to ask you whether you thought that politics was still a bit of a hostile environment for women. And just go back to a, a tweet you did when it was after your first official meeting with Theresa May when she'd become... Prime Minister 2016 and you tweeted politics aside I hope girls everywhere look at this photograph and believe nothing should be off limits for them and it was a photograph of the two of you um 
Do you, that is about ambition, but do you think that politics is still difficult for women? Oh, God, yeah. Um, and in some ways, so in some ways easier because there's more of us, still not enough, but more of us. So there's there's more of a critical mass, safety in numbers, whatever you want to, to describe it as. Um, but there are other ways in which it's much harder. Social media makes it much harder because that the the people out there who are deeply sexist, deeply misogynist, um, have got more direct ways of getting to you. And and that environment, I think, is in some ways, for that reason, much more hostile. I'm not sure, honestly, hand on heart, if if Twitter had existed when I was growing up, would I be sitting here right now? I don't, I don't know, Gen genuinely, because it That's is terrifying. really, really hard, I think, if you're a younger woman in particular, to, to live with and, and find ways of coping mm. with that. And that, I suppose, if there's one thing that worries me about the, the continued progress of women in politics, it's that. Um, and, you know, this is a bit flippant, but that photograph you talked about with Theresa May and I, um, I can't remember if it was that meeting or the next one we had together, the front page of the Daily Mail the next day of the two of us sitting together talking about serious weighty matters of state was a picture of our legs. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I can't remember the headline. Uh, it, what was it? Really who, who cares about Brexit? Who won legs it? That's it. Legs it. And, yeah. and OK, slightly lighthearted, but actually there in a nutshell, it, albeit in a, the softer sense of that, is what women still have to deal with. And have you found that focus on appearance particularly tricky during this massive crisis that you've been dealing with you know <laughs> yes. and we're all in lockdown you know having to make do on haircuts and things has that been difficult uh, well cutting my hair myself and coloring <laughs> my hair myself has been horrendously <laughs> difficult but there's this massive conspiracy theory in scotland um, mainly by men the number of men on social media who uh, are obsessed with my hair is and they is, think you wear a wig. is about freaky no they think i've been sneaking off to a hairdresser <laughs> to get it done professionally now you've got are... a career after first minister as a hairdresser no i no i don't um <laughs> the first time i had to color my hair during lockdown i my wonderful hairdresser who i'm looking forward to seeing very very soon um she sent me the the hair dye so that i could do it using professional hair dye and she <laughs> came on facetime to talk me through it I forgot to put the gloves on, so my hands were <laughs> black for the, the next week. Um, <laughs> not a good look. No. You've also spoken in the past about um, not just hurtful questions about your appearance, but also your personal life, repeated mm. questions about your lack of children. And that eventually prompted you to talk very movingly about your miscarriage. Was that a really difficult decision to, to talk about that? Um, it was, yeah. I mean, I, I think... Talking about something like that is is not something I would ever do lightly, and and you know, for both myself and Peter, my husband, it was we thought long and hard about whether to do it. Um, and I suppose for me personally, it was because you know you you can sort of shrug off questions of that nature when you're in your twenties or even into your thirties. Once you get into your forties, it just becomes a little bit obtrusive. So it was a kind of way of me putting an end <laughs> to the endless mm. questions of people who clearly just weren't you know thinking through it but it was also I suppose about trying in a very small way to to make a contribution to hopefully a time when women don't have to constantly be asked these questions and I suppose to try to because the assumption was always made about me that you know I'd somehow because I was this cold um, hard-faced you know ambitious aggressive woman that I decided to prioritize career over children and I suppose the point I wanted to make is that there are many reasons why some women don't have children. For some women, it's exactly what I've described, maybe without all the pejorative language. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's, yeah. Women are entitled to make that choice. Sometimes women can't have children. Sometimes we, we delay it for, for periods. And, and so the point I was making is that at different points of my life, all of these things have been true. So don't make assumptions about something that is intensely personal. And and why should women in the public eye constantly be asked that question? I mean, I used to, you know, talking about Alex Hammond earlier on, who was, you know, my predecessor as leader, he doesn't have children. I don't mm. think I've ever heard him once being asked in an interview why he yeah. didn't have children. Whereas for a period of my life, it was probably the question that, it, or this would not be true, but it's how it felt to me for a period that it was a question I was asked more than anything else. Your final piece of advice to women who may be listening to this, 
maybe contemplating a career in politics, maybe something completely different. Just tell me your the biggest challenge of your life and how you successfully overcame it. I think for me, it was learning to be comfortable in my own skin, um, which is another way of saying just be myself and accept my my imperfections and embrace them in some respects because they all make up part of who you are and I never stop trying to learn and and be better at what you do and never ever take success for granted because it shouldn't come easy and it's never guaranteed so work hard but be yourself and at the end of the day we only get one life uh, and this this is definitely something I feel the older I get um, and as you said I'm earlier on I'm getting older um, and it's a bit trite but it's true nothing is worth being unhappy over if, if you find whatever it is you're doing in life makes you unhappy do something else because we only get one shot at this